I read a book a week. These are my top for branding and marketing. Before we get into these five books, let me make it clear. Sales, persuasion, creativity, psychology, they're all extremely important. But right now, we're not gonna focus on any of those. I'll be sharing with you some not so basic fundamentals on what a brand is, specifically in today's digital context, and how you and your team can go about reaching your customers on any platform. You want your local events company to be known across the city. You envision building a brand that goes on to dominate, be number one in your space. Or you're in school, you're in business school or college majoring in marketing. You wanna have that edge when you're out in the real world. Either way, to even have this level of interest you have in promoting something is rare. I'm not just gonna tell you these five books. I'll also go deeper, share with you how I make sense of the latest happening right now in marketing. I've implemented some of these concepts and strategies myself but you can pick and choose which ones you should leverage given the stage you're at and where you wanna be. And this is not for everybody. Only for those who have this, this urgency to create and offer something of real value. Contagious by Jonah Berger. Today, what's the most targeted kind of advertising? Time we spend on Facebook is going down. Instagram is growing, but still not the most targeted. LinkedIn, really effective ads right now, but no, not the most targeted. The most targeted advertising has actually been around for a couple of centuries. It's word of mouth. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Now, word of mouth can be talking to someone or sharing over messages. Now, keep in mind though, even today, only 7% of word of mouth happens online. This is of course true in B2B, where your customers are companies. We do business with people we know. We constantly exchange contacts of vendors or subcontractors. And for most consumer products, we go by what our friends and family are using, right? So even though this book was the best marketing book back in 2014, the reasons why we share something stays the same. He's a Wharton professor, so everything he says is actually based on hardcore academic research, bunch of real statistics, but present it in a way that's so easy to relate to. Steps. Six factors to predict popularity. Social currency. Does it make me look good? Think about it. What do we love sharing online? We share photos of occasions where we go out to this really exotic restaurant or bar, or even when you get some new luxury item. And you figure, how can I just include this in my next post? He talks about status, how people willingly tie themselves to certain products. Actually, a recent example I'd say is the AirPods. I lost mine a while ago, but wearing them itself has become quite a statement. It's like an easy conversation starter, you see? So social currency gets people sharing, but how do they keep doing it? He then explains the concept of a trigger and makes you wanna consider in what context are people reminded of your product. Next, emotions. There's an old saying, we buy with emotion and justify with logic. Today, there's a much longer customer journey, so many different touch points, so many different outlets to consider even before someone knows exactly what you're offering. For example, people share news articles about a tax hike that could happen. Now, you could use that to get more attention if you're an attorney or run any kind of legal services or accounting firm. Bottom line, when we feel strong emotions, we want to share it. Public. What do we see people doing? Does your product advertise itself? It's a little hard to influence if your product is not seen. Were you aware that anti-drug commercials could actually increase drug use? They say two things at once. Drugs are bad, but a lot of people are doing them. And the more we see that, the more likely it becomes normal. Another example of how authorities can really end up achieving exactly the opposite. A few years ago, Music Association's website warned people that only 37% of music was paid for. And people thought, oh, it seemed like an idiot to pay for music. You can guess how this affected piracy. Practical value. Is it actually helpful? So for those of you who follow me online, you'll see I constantly share what I think about the latest trends in business and media that should help you see things much more clearly from both a business standpoint and as a consumer. We are seeing much more of this on social media. 
Make giving value upfront your number one priority. Providing tips or information through articles and you'll figure out how to connect it to your product or service along the way. Stories. How can your product or idea be part of a larger story? See, we don't just share information, we tell stories. Remember the Will It Blend video series? Yeah, it was funny to see the iPhone shatter, it was all entertaining, cool. But the sales for the blender actually went up as the video went viral. So there you have it. Six factors to predict popularity. Check this out, it's pretty concise to see how you could make something that people actually want to share. This is marketing. Isn't that a lovely cover? So people don't know what they want. They know what they dream of. They know what they fantasize about. We obviously focus too much on demographics, male or female, age and annual income. We actually neglect what's really undervalued today, especially the kind of data that Facebook collects. And that is psychographics. What's that? See, it's difficult to create something that really matters and pleases everyone. You gotta try and understand the dreams, desires, and fears of the people you wanna serve. What I find most valuable about any of Seth's work generally is he breaks down what a brand is. What if Apple made a hotel? You're visualizing something, you're, you're visualizing something grand, right? Now, ask yourself, what if Marriott made a phone? Blank, right? One of them is a much stronger brand. Be very clear. A brand is not just a logo. A brand is trust. A brand is connection. And what's ever so crucial today is interaction. A brand that you have a direct relationship with. And that's exactly why we are seeing many more tech companies invest in their own distribution. So they take control of the retail experience. Also ask yourself, how can I market with people instead of at them? Well, it would appear that I have something that you want. I'm sorry, something that you need. You'll start to see a clear split between direct marketing and brand building. Today's services like Airbnb do kind of like a hybrid. They do marketing campaigns to get new people to use it, but then the experience of your holiday, meeting your host, and just having a pleasant time overall, that experience that you come back and share in your circle, that itself becomes the brand. You can do 100% direct marketing, but you're gonna have to get someone to pay for those impressions online or offline over a long period. There's a fantastic chapter, Treat Different People Differently. Clearly breaks down all the different kind of users you will have at different stages as you grow. Essentially, it's the hype cycle, but he articulates why many companies don't even cross the chasm. Too often, we just reverse engineer her business model to come up with a mission statement, right? With this book, you really learn to take a step back and learn how to have real empathy for who you're serving. Remember I told you this message is not for everybody? If you just wanna keep consuming content for the rest of your life, and never ever take a shot at creating something and delivering real value, being known for who you are or what you're building, you're not the person for this. <laughs> there has got to be a part of you, whether you're a marketer or not, there's got to be a part of you that just wants to express, wants to express what they're about, what their work is, what their company does, and that is who I'm speaking to. Hooked talks about how only a few companies build the kind of products that keep us engaged, almost like an addiction. See, every book I recommend here has a very specific purpose. A lot of us focus on just having more growth. We grew 10% last month. We converted 600. We ran this new campaign, target, target so and so. It gives us a 20% ROI. It's all about getting more and more new users, new customers, but not on how to retain them, not on how to cross sell. We don't focus on how we can get closer to a more direct way of staying in touch with your customers. Face it, we don't wanna put in the effort to see how to keep them interested because you are seeing instant results by pumping more on Google and Facebook ads. And you are just getting more and more dependent on those two or three platforms, just not a sustainable thing long-term. How do you keep them coming back to your websites or your apps or even just maintaining a sizable email list of people that you cater to? So in terms of where people's attentions are, in the consumer space, you obviously have social networks. 
Even in the enterprise space, you have GitHub, Slack, and good old email. You know that satisfaction you get when you've cleared your inbox? Here in this book, you'll learn exactly what drives this level of engagement. Nir Ayal breaks down what a hook is that every mainstream service today has built in within their experience. He says, the only reason we use a product is to change our mood or make us feel something different. When we feel lonely, we go on our feed. For a different kind of loneliness, swipe right. What about when we feel a little uncertain? We Google. And during the day when you're bored, you check YouTube, Reddit, stock prices, sports scores, news. All of these products cater to just one sensation, one internal sensation, boredom. People check their phones how many times a day? On average. We check our phones 150 times a day. These products have more than just daily users. And don't make this common mistake of just blaming it on technology. It's actually very basic instincts we have. I'll tell you what I mean. What makes gambling addictive? It's unpredictable. What makes romance fun? It's a surprise. See, today we just have more access, more information, and more speed. Okay, so how is this relevant to marketing? Well, let me ask you, how do you keep your users' attention? I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Think about how hard it is to use a website of a small business or a government website, right? They're so far behind in terms of usability. There is so much opportunity to make people want to use them and get the jobs they need done. And to do that, you really need to understand how to earn and keep your users interested. So not just creative guys, this would be super helpful for product designers or if you're into analytics. You're not sure if you wanna read the whole book, that's okay. You can start by reading articles by Nirayal that he publishes online. They're pretty short and insightful. Great place to start. So if you've been noticing, I am moving from marketing as you know it to the value of brand building and then how the product itself, like all the major services today, acts as the marketing. I know this sounds a little strange for some of you. What, what, what is he talking about? People assume that a product has inherent value and that marketing is some sort of magic dust sprinkled on top. You think of it as an added cost, especially those of us with any financial background, instead of realizing it is a way to create value. This book, Alchemy, came out in 2019. It's by Rory Sutherland, vice chairman of Ogilvy. I really wanted to rank this number one, but you'll know why in a bit it didn't make it. It's actually a really fun read. But at the core, it's about how we're all too obsessed with logic and metrics. How many of you, doesn't matter what industry, how many of you have tried to say something using words and a guy shows up with a spreadsheet and that's it? More data leads to better decisions, except when it doesn't. So why is it that we value numbers so much? No one ever gets fired for coming up with a rational answer. See, the way Rory explains it is by comparing with traditional economics. We all know the basics. Economic logic assumes human behavior is objective, without any idea of status, without any context, and that there's perfect information. And all we do is independently try to maximize our utility. In this model of the world, everyone would know exactly how much they'd pay for something. Spoiler alert, that never exists. In a perfect world with perfect information, advertising would not exist. Ooh, economics. Very, very interesting. We don't even know why we make decisions, let alone why we think others make them. $15, not the same as $15, usual price $29. Or 50% extra seems a lot better than 33% off, means the same thing. What's the most effective kind of advertising outlet today? Social media? That's right. But why don't we see brands stop advertising on TV or billboards? Could be because they're after an older segment, still watch a lot of TV. Could be because it's, it's easier to market digitally, right? We're not able to see value in anything else. Let me just say this. There is still something really, really effective about marketing on TV or billboards. And that is, it signals something to your audience. It signals a huge expense upfront. And the perception is like, oh, that's an established company. 
See, marketing guys face problems because everyone in other parts of the business think their job is a science and their job is to be completely right. What you'll notice is we are spending marketing budgets not on what could be the most effective, but what can be proven or measured to be effective. We're seeing organizations set up more cross-functional teams like ops and tech together, but marketing by and large is still its own silo filled with pseudo intellectuals. For those of you who know the series, the Mad Men era of advertising is over. This book really gives you a broad framework on behavioral economics, a bunch of different topics in tiny chapters about how we actually make decisions to buy something, which is not just objectively, but with meaning and context. Okay, the number one book on branding and marketing doesn't talk about how you should create ads. It's not about making your content go viral. It is all about positioning yourself in the marketplace. Blue Ocean Shift or Blue Ocean Strategy, that's the original book. I think it's over 10 years old. Get your hands on either one of them. This is one of the first business books I've read. You have the Red Ocean, completely bloody place, companies constantly trying to grab market share back and forth. You sail to the Blue Ocean, you have a whole new product category. You create a whole new market for yourself. So real quick, very powerful exercise. At a high level, four levers for you to adjust. Eliminate, what factors can you completely remove which everyone else in the industry has? Raise, what could you do better than the industry standard? Reduce, what could you continue to offer but far less than others? And finally, create, what can you create that no one else has? Take Amazon, massive company, master of not just e-commerce, but I heard the other day AWS, their cloud computing service, is now by itself bringing in the most profits for them. So naturally people think Bezos and the whole company is just unstoppable, whichever industry they enter. But if you looked at their history, they failed a lot. They tried to go up against Zappos, eventually had to buy them, tried to compete with smartphones, the Fire Phone. But the underlying lesson in both these cases is whichever industry Amazon tried to compete in and they tried to imitate a company that created a blue ocean, they miserably fail. Which is why, if you notice today, the fastest growing e-commerce company is Canadian company, Shopify. Now watch this, Amazon is partnering with Shopify in some regions, as opposed to even trying to replicate their model. We often go deeper and deeper within our industry, we keep studying it, which is essential. And then when you combine your insights from what you could borrow from other industries, now that is when you're at a real advantage. I think most people speak enough to their customers. We should be interacting with our non-customers even more because they will give you a unique perspective on how they perceive the product, how the industry is perceived as a whole, which will give you insight on how to change things, how to turn those non-customers into potential buyers, if that's a segment you're after. There's also an interesting point about the amount of opportunity available. We tend to look at business as a zero-sum game. And that's a really cutthroat, limited mindset to have. Yeah, there are disruptive innovations every once in a while, digital cameras killing uh, you know, film companies. Not too long ago, Nokia folded when smartphones took off. But there's also a second kind of innovation, non-disruptive creation, where you don't displace anyone, you try to solve a new problem. Take microfinance. Billions of dollars made available for rural areas, people who want to build something for their communities, now have access to credit. They can take loans to invest. And Wall Street, the rest of finance, they're doing just fine because they weren't going after this market with this sort of an offering in the first place. You don't have to go head on with Goliath, at least at first. On the other hand, many corporations know they have to completely change the way they do business if they want to have a chance of surviving 10 years from now. But they just aren't making the shift. This book really provides practical frameworks for you to go about implementing change at every level. Okay, Jaya, all this is great, but you know, it's super theoretical. It's the kind of stuff that we learn in academic business schools. In fact, both the authors are professors uh, at INSEAD. Oh, you know, all this might be true, but my industry, we're heavily regulated. I just don't see a blue ocean. Simple question. Do you think someone will come up with a blue ocean in your space in the next 20 years? Yeah? So why don't you reinvent yourself? And just to be clear, this is not just for executives. 
it's most effective when the whole organization, every single vertical, every single team is on one page. Look, especially with this edition, it's packed with actual processes, exercises to incrementally make that shift. Don't read this book, study this book, and probably even repeat these exercises year over year. Don't be a me too business. Sit down with your team, map out exactly how you are gonna position yourself to stand out in the marketplace. It actually shocks me how there is such an abundance of great content, great businesses, great ideas, but just because of this perception of marketing as a separate task, they don't take off. And if you're like most people, you see there's no traction, you're gonna lose your drive. Before we wrap this up, I wanted to give you my take on what's possibly the biggest issue stopping most people from doing well in marketing. I was talking to someone the other day, there's still a notion of marketing, whether it's promoting yourself, your services or products, it's not very noble. Some go as far as to say marketing is evil. You'll notice the moment you start promoting yourself or your company, you might be seen as the self-obsessed, clever manipulator, like all these MNCs. Let's get something straight. It's not about manipulating people, it's about getting people what they want. No, no, you know, you know the whole consumerism thing, the advertising industry sells us things we don't want. This phone or computer you were watching the video on was marketed to you before you chose to get it. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret at this point. There are talks of a possible economic downturn sometime soon, and I was thinking, being a fan of Tim Cook, I'm gonna buy a few Apple products around that time to show my support. Really? See, the only reason we buy something is because we see value in it, period. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Electrical appliances are a thing from the past. Now it's online sites. Facebook is manipulating me. They decide what content to show me. They decide what ads to show me. Short answer, you are manipulating Facebook by indicating just how interested and engaging you find those cat videos. It is high time we take responsibility for what we choose to consume. And let me highlight something. Marketing is essentially about making change. So apart from all these commercial sided things, you're a policymaker or scientist, doctor, you're a politician, you run a nonprofit, you all depend on marketing to get your ideas out. We could have a dedicated segment just on personal branding. Anyways, write your comments or reviews on which ideas you found most valuable and relevant. I hope you're already planning what to read next Frankly, it's been a pretty heavy video, so go deeper on whichever ideas fascinated you the most. Taking notes is a good idea, or just watch this video again to really internalize. Bye-bye.